I'm going to do my more formal introductions to our three speakers who will speak to you about the book, both its overall sort of summarizing the overall aims and what the new knowledge produced, as well as their particular chapters in the volume. So first of all, beginning with Dr. Lynn Jo, she is, a, she is a distinguished professor of sociology and Asian American studies, the Walter and Shirley Wang Endowed Chair in US-China Relations and Communications, and director of the Asia Pacific Center at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is a globally recognized scholar whose expertise on migration and development, race and ethnicity, Chinese diaspora, and Asian American studies, among other areas, is wide, are widely acknowledged. Min is extensively cited for her many publications, including her award-winning book, The Asian American of the Asian American Achievement Paradox, published in 2015, The Rise of the New Second Generation, published in 2016, Contemporary Chinese Diasporas, an edited volume that came out in 2017, and then of course the book we're here to learn about today, Beyond Economic Migration, which she co-edited with Dr. Mahmoud and that came out in 2023. Moving on to our second speaker today, Professor Hassan Mahmoud is Assistant Professor in Residence at Northwestern University of Qatar. He received his PhD in Sociology from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has a long-standing professional relationship with Dr. Joe. And his teaching and research interests include Sociology of Development, International Migration, Racialization and Identity Politics, and Global Ethnography. One of his major scholarly undertakings to develop a sociological approach to studying migrants' remittances. Dr. Mahmoud has published widely in a number of journals, including Sociological Perspectives, Current Sociology, and the International Social Science Journal. And of course, he is co-edited, uh, he is co-editor of the volume we are speaking about today. And last but not least, my colleague, Ms. Bhatti, Misba is the research analyst here at CIRS. She received her master's degree from the London School of Economics and is currently um, instrumental in to her work to support CIRS's research mandate. Misba is also responsible for maintaining all our online research presence as well as generating background research for the various projects we undertake. She is also the author of chapter nine in the Beyond Economic Migration volume and her chapter focuses on the experiences of skilled female Pakistani migrants in the U.S. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Jo. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much, Dr. Ama, for your generous introduction of our, you know, of ourselves and also our book. And. Um, so today's event features with the official launch of our new book, Beyond Economic Migration, co-edited with my former student and my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Hassan Mahmoud. I first thank the staff at the Center for International and Regional Studies at Georgetown University in Qatar for organizing this book from conception to the publication. Thank you also, thank you all in the audience for coming and for joining us in celebrating the publication of the book. Our book focuses on U.S. immigration. As we know, at the turn of the 21st century, um, there has been a period of rapid population movement across national borders with the number of international migrants across um, a worldwide increasing from 153 million in 1990 to 272 million in 2019. The United States took the lion's share, receiving one fifth of the world's international migrants, mostly from developing countries. Today, the foreign born population in the U.S. reached a record number of more than 45 million, 
accounting for 15% of the total population. More than three quarters entered the country legally and about half were naturalized U.S. citizens. Contemporary immigrants to the U.S. are extremely diverse across a variety of categories, economic and political, temporary and permanent, legal and undocumented, low skill and high skill, single and family, as well as refugees and asylees, and also by individual attributes like age, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, and socioeconomic background. This contemporary immigrants to the United States hail from diverse origins, about 25% coming from Mexico alone, and 15% from Central and South America, 10% from the Caribbean, 28% uh, from Asia, 4% from the Middle East and North Africa, and 5% from Sub-Saharan uh, Sub Africa. Only about 13% were from Europe, uh, compared to the turn of last century, where more than 90% of the immigrants to the United States were from Europe. There are also tremendous di the tremendously diverse socioeconomic characteristics with wide variations in the educational selectivity by national origin. For example, more than 77% of South Asian um, immigrants had a college degree, and more than half of those from China, the Middle East, and North Africa are college graduates, compared to only 7% of Mexicans and about 11% of those from Central America had a, a bachelor's degree or more. And the U.S. population, about a third of them had, the U.S. foreign-born population, about a third had a college degree. And the total population, about 28%. So you can see the diverse um, uh, socioeconomic characteristics of these immigrants. And studies of international migration are generally concerned with two central questions. One, why people move away from their homeland and resettle in a new place. And two, once they arrive in the new place, how well they adapt to assimilate or integrate into the whole society. As to reasons of moving to the US, most understandings center around two primary factors. Either there was trouble in the home country, such as political unrest, famine, or natural disasters that pushed people out. Or there was a general yearning for a better life or more opportunity. Often conceptualized as the American dream. And in fact, the meaning of this American dream usually refers to freedom, and social economic betterment. However, migration scholarship has often emphasized the economic factors to the neglect of other social, historical, and political factors. Our book project began with a focus on economic migration to the US, but as we move forward, we shifted focus to provide a critique of the economic model of immigration. We argue that from the, uh, for the dream of fair and equitable migration to be realized, analysis of cross-border movements, resettlement, integration, and transnationalism must pay attention to how migrants' individual attributes interact with institutional mechanisms and social processes. Our team comprised of 12 distinguished scholars from sociology, demography, economics, political science, and international relations. 10 of them were immigrants themselves. Myself from China, Hassan from Bangladesh, and Mishma from Pakistan, and others from Mexico, Cuba, India, 
and Sierra Leone from Southwestern Africa. We also have one American immigrant to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so these authors offer a nuanced look at critical issues affecting the motives to migrate and outcomes of integration. So we have chapter one by Paya Banerjee on digital capitalism, she can, in which she conceptualizes the immigrant beyond the framing based primarily in terms of livelihood skill or sectors of specific employment. And chapter two by uh, Rene Zentano is on evolving trends of Latin American migration to the US, showing that these trends are not driven merely by push-pull factors, but by a combination of demographic changes in both sending and receiving countries, as well as racialized immigration control in the US. And chapter three is by myself, focusing on Americans of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean descent from a historical perspective. And chapter four by Catherine Donado and Catalina Dorente, it offers an overview of the U.S. visa system and changes in immigration policy since 1990. Chapter five is on preferential hiring and the U.S. earnings of skilled temporary workers by Lindsay Lowell from Georgetown University. And chapter six is on skill, is also on skilled temporary foreign workers, but focus on those from India. Uh, chapter seven is on international student mobility as a source of skill migration by Terry Woodensburg. He's the American immigrant to Canada. Uh, chapter eight by Kevin Thomas, uh, who calls attention to the very effect of fields of study on economic incorporation of highly skilled immigrants from Africa. And chapter nine is by Ms. Ba, and she will introduce her chapter. And chapter 10 is by Sylvia Pedraza, who demonstrates three types of transnationalism, economic, political, and social, through examples from, histo from the history of many immigrant groups in the United States and highlights the role of gen that gender plays in these three types of transnationalism. And chapter 11 is by Hassan, uh, as, uh, is a case study of Bangladeshi immigrants in Los Angeles and their transnational practices. Overall, the chapters in this book examines the persistent and evolving phenomenon of economic migration to the United States. However, we know that the descriptor economic may be misleading. As our chapters show, chance, patterns, causes, and consequences of economic migration, of uh, this migration, transnationalism, and integration are impacted by multi-layer social, political, and social cultural processes beyond economic logic. Various non-economic factors in both sending and receiving countries have been found to shape the entire terrain of migration from the decision to leave the homeland to resettlement and integration in the country of destination. We thus reiterate the need of paying attention, paying close attention to the social cultural forces and political institutional context in the study of economic migration. Now this edited volume has been completed during the worst global pandemic in human history. The COVID-19 pandemic caused lockdowns, forced border closing, and physical distancing, making it tremendously challenging for collaborative research of our kind. We are immensely grateful for the resilience, dedication, and exceptional effort from all individuals, authors, and staff support behind. 
First and foremost, the book is the result of a collaborative project spearheaded and supported by CIRS. Um, and in mid in mid February 2020, that was just a few days before the lockdown, CIRS organized a research roundtable of economic migration to the United States and invited a group of distinguished scholars um, to Washington, D.C. The initial roundtable discussion was extremely intellectually stimulating and productive and led to the formation of a working group for the current book project. Members of the working group were then invited to develop their res respective chapters to be discussed and reviewed by peers in an other workshop eight months later. Originally, uh, you know, to how to be here, but because of the, the pandemic, we held uh, virtually. The book is the culmination of the discussion held in these two workshops and several rounds of rigorous reviews and revisions afterwards. We are therefore deeply indebted to the CIRS leadership and its extraordinary capable and supportive staff. We are particularly thankful to Dr. Ahmad Dalal, former Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar, and Dr. Zara, Associate Director for Research at CIRS, for entrusting us to lead the project uh, as co-editors and offer their unfavoring support, guidance, and resources. I still have this vivid memory of that Zoom meeting at 6 a.m. in the morning, Pacific <laughs> times, when uh, Ahmad and Zara uh, was convincingly taught me into leading this project. Um, so CIRS has also provided us with excellent staff support. Dr. Susie, Susie over there, Susie, uh, Assistant Director and Managing Editor for Publication at CIRS has provided not only careful reading and meticulous copy editing of the entire manuscript, but also critical comments and thorough editorial feedback. So this support is really crucial for us and help us tremendously and also help enhance the quality and readability of our book. Um, and we also thank Elizabeth here uh, operations manager at CIRS for her administrative support. The book is the product of amazing teamwork. We would like to thank all our contributors for their active participation and seamless collaboration across geographic uh, boundaries while braving the pandemic and also have to uh, endure my hustle. Uh, so the, the co collaboration also cemented our friendship along the way. We are incredibly fortunate to have received the immediate attention of Jennifer Hammer, senior editor at New York University Press. We are very fortunate. And Jennifer has been very responsive and enthusiastic about our book manuscript and has pushed it through the rigorous review process in record time. Like within three months, we got the review back. Uh, so it was amazing. Uh, last but not least, our deepest gratitude goes to our families whose love and support are always heartfelt, no matter where we are on earth. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Babo, for inviting me, well, actually, including me in the project. Uh, initial, at the initial stage, um, I heard about it and, and we uh, spoke about it, but I was otherwise kind of hey, occupied, so I I just you know couldn't join. But then um, situation changed because of the pandemic and also uh, uh, it was and because Dr. Joe was yeah. able to assert a great deal of pressure. <laughs> and and then uh, yeah, uh, my supervisor, PhD supervisor, uh, she actually wanted me in the project, and so she also told me that you have.
have to be here because, you know, <laughs> a long, you know, elaboration of the reasons why I should be the prophet, right? So I actually had to say yes. Well, I... You don't have to <laughs> <choice. laughs> I was interested. This is my core area of uh, expertise and religious reading. I have been reading about migration for so long, like since 2008. And so these are like my familiar fields, but I was otherwise occupied with my own book method field. By that, uh, by that time, I was uh, uh, in a like uh, comfortable shape, so I said, yeah, I'll jump in. And then I started reading all these chapters, these chapters, and um, I would make comments, but these are like senior scholars in the field, so I knew some of them personally. I told uh, Dr. Min that I can do a lot of other things except emailing them, saying that you have to make this change, you have to revise this, it is, it is not feeling well, you need to bring this, I mean, you know. So that's why, that's why she had to hustle, you know, both ways, like with the management, with the, with the support of, you know, team, but also with the authors. So in, uh, this is, uh, in this uh, chapter, I uh, focus on migrant remittance as one of the uh, transnational practices. Actually, this is the most frequent transnational practice that any migrant, migrant engages in, right? And uh, my, my entry to the field of migration studies actually began with the idea of remittance as an alternative fund for development. I'm from Bangladesh, and in Bangladesh and a few other countries, migrant remittance is hugely important and talked about as if, like, like petrol dollar, you know, in the Middle East. Um, it's not actually my uh, development fund, but it was projected and people expected that it would generate a lot of development despite, uh, you know, lacking in other areas. Uh, so um, I started uh, with this question, why do migrants send remittances? Because ultimately I wanted, to, I wanted to learn from migrants themselves why they send remittances rather than taking experts opinion about remittance as development. Right? And it's as simple as this. If you have family across border, if you are, and if your family needs money, financial support, you just do it. Sometimes it may appear rational, sometimes it's irrational. It's totally emotional, right? So what is the point of like looking for a rational uh, reason other than asking the person himself or herself about why he or she is sending money home? That's, that's where I started uh, kind of like suspecting and then questioning the dominant paradigm which uh, tries to explain migrants' remittances in terms of either altruism or self-interest. I said, yeah, both are there. So what is the, you know, yeah. what is the ultimate reason? I didn't find it there and so I started reading uh, theories, I started reading empirical research and then gradually I came to a point when I kind of like gave up on the existing, um, theories and then I started looking at other possible sociological, like classical sociological explanations about why migrants, why individuals act in certain ways and then taking those ideas to understand migrant remittances. And that's where I recognized that migrants, from the migrants talk about remittances, that they send money to take care of their family that are living behind. They also send money to realize uh, their aspiration for upward mobility, which they cannot, for various reasons, cannot uh, realize in their destination country. So they send money back to their origin. For example, they usually aren't, especially those who are in like lower, um, lower strata in the job market, they aren't really little. And so their savings is so small that they cannot do anything in terms of like investment or purchasing in the destination, in the US, right? But once they send that money back home to Bangladesh, it becomes like really sizable amount with which they can uh, purchase land, uh, real estate, they can even initiate different like income generating activities. So that's where they see a possibility of becoming an, a, a house owner or home owner or land owner, which comes with both economic uh, um, income as well as social prestige. So the upward mobility they see blocked in the US for them, they kind of like try an alternative way to send money back to Bangladesh and becoming some kind of like, you know, 
socially respectable as well as economic, economically better off uh, individuals. Uh, then for the, particularly for those in um, professional upper, upper, upper middle class uh, uh, position in, back in the US, they also face a kind of like different situations towards their retirement life when their children grow up, move out and move away. They also kind of like um, got their um, professional networks cut off after retirement. So they find themselves alone, which uh, they don't like because they saw their parents, their grandparents living with like children, grandchildren, friends, relatives, but uh, they have found themselves all alone. That's where they start realizing that they need to find or reconnect to their friends and relatives, uh, not in the US because they are dispersed. They move away in different spaces, in different places. So they reconnect to their origin among their uh, old friends, their rel distant relatives, their neighbors in the origin village uh, by sending remittances. So uh, in this way, I recognize a, a set of uh, reasons for which these migrants told me that they send remittances. And, and that's how I kind of like uh, try to articulate uh, based on their reasoning about why they send remittances, which go beyond this like economic rational um, you know, formulation in terms of either self-interest or altruism. And uh, this is a um, case study, one of the case studies. Uh, my other uh, comparative case was in uh, Japan where I saw similarities but also differences because of the uh, different characteristics of the uh, um, uh, receipt, uh, uh, I mean the context of reception because Japan immigration is di different and differently managed because of those structural and um, structures and processes, uh, the kind of uh, pressure that migrants feel and the kind of opportunities they recognize over there are different, which have an impact on their remitting practices, which is not part of this uh, chapter, but uh, my, uh, the, the book I'm writing. So uh, that's all about my um, uh, chapter in which basically I kind of like outline my shift from migration and development to migration and remit uh, transnationalism and ultimately will go back to like home and belonging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ba? Well, when you have experts speaking on a topic, you just want them to keep on talking That's and true. Uh, pitch in very little. But since um, I'm on the panel, um, without sounding too cliched, I would like to thank uh, my team here at, at CRS to give me the opportunity to present my research today, as well as to give me the chance to be part of this book project with experts as is um, Dr. Min and Dr. Hudson. So thank you very much. And so moving on to my chapter, since you're here to hear more about that and not about praises. Um, my chapter is titled Highly Skilled Female Pakistani Immigrants Devalued Credentials. It's chapter nine in the book. And it looks at the issue of devalued credentials among highly skilled female immigrants from Pakistan who have migrated to the US and are living in, in the US un, under various visa categories. So they could be under a visa category such as H-1B or they could be under different visa categories uh, of spouses of US citizens themselves or in the process of getting their green cards. And since we are here to celebrate the book itself, I would like to highlight um, another chapter in this book that talks about these visa categories and visa systems in the US, which is chapter four uh, by Catherine Donato and Catalin Donaris. If you have the volume, please read that as well. Um, but what does my chapter does? Um, so what I've tried to do, and underlining the word tried here mostly, is to examine the experiences of highly skilled female migrants um, and detail the issues that they face in the US with regards to the devaluation of their foreign earned degrees. And by foreign earned degrees, I mean uh, degrees earned in Pakistan from Pakistani institutions. And I wanna highlight that mostly because we are in a branch campus of a US university here or satellite campus of a uni uh, US university. So it's Pakistani institutions and Pakistani degrees. 
And why am I focusing on females in particular and not migrants in general when it comes to the devaluation of degrees? And um, as Zahra mentioned in the beginning, when we were formulating this project and we were doing the background research, I was very fortunate to be part of that team. And um, during that process, um, I came across a plethora of, of well-researched, documented uh, literature that talked about this issue when it came to migrants, whether it was in the US, whether it was in the UK, whether it was in Canada or other European um, uh, countries in general. And the, the female aspect of it was missing. And I thought, you know, the issues that the females face when it comes to um, this process in the US is very unique. Their experiences are very unique and different. And the challenges that they face sometimes are different from their male counterparts. So that needed highlighting in the literature. And I've tried to fill that gap with, with this. Um, also, there was very little um, secondary resources on this topic. So I had to do a lot of primary um, data collection. With that said, I do concur to the point that migrant professionals, when they, when they come from you know, developing, developing economies, regardless of their gender, they do face this, this, this process of devaluation of their foreign earned degrees. So what is particular to the females? And to do this, I had to um, do interview-based data collection. And when I was envisioning this, I was very, very optimistic. I would like, I'm going to go to the US over the summer and collect the data and meet the people in person and you know have meet these wonderful uh, females um, and have the face-to-face -face interaction and gather uh, amazing, amazing research. Lo and behold, we're hit with COVID. And all my planning went to down the drain and I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? And I'm, you know, this was the era of Zoom and we were trying to figure out, you know, how to make things work, and I'm like, you know, this is not gonna work. You know, if you've done interview-based data collection, it's always nice to, you know, be in, in, in person, in the room with your interviewee, so you can build that connection, you can put the other person at ease, you start with, you know, small commentaries, and, oh, you look really nice, you can't do that over Zoom if their camera's off. Um, so I was like, what am I going to do? But, contrary to my belief, when you are an immigrant to a country and you have family across the border, you are very much in tuned to video calls to your family, right? So you have the experience of talking to your family members hours and hours on day, and you're very comfortable talking to someone random in that sense. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is great, I love this. And so um, I had the opportunity to interview 20 females um, in the US. This was again during Ramadan, so the time difference married, and we were all under, you know, our Ramadan brain. So, you know, it was it was that affecting the conversations as well. But they were very open to, you know, follow up conversations and uh, filling in any details that I wanted in written format. So that that was really helpful. Um, and uh, these twenty females, I uh, because I'm talking about highly skilled uh, migrants, um, so I had to narrow them down to the STEM field. So these were doctors, engineers. IT professionals, people with PhDs um, that were included in this, in this data set. Um, and the information that was gathered from these interviews um, were based on the knowledge, their views, and their personal experiences. And I tried to analyze these experiences um, when it came to getting their foreign degrees accredited and evaluated in, in the US. And um, my primary or the main argument with this is that, and this is very much collected from the interviews that I did, is that the highly skilled migrant women from Pakistan um, face systematic dual disadvantages, which are based A, on their gender and the country of origin of their foreign earned degrees, as well as migration policies when it comes to the credit evaluation and their because of this, they're often underrepresented in the US um, labor force. So what does this mean? This means that despite having a um, high level of education and work experiences, these women face significant barriers to obtaining uh, employment that is not only matching their qualifications, but also that um, 
comes across with their training and their degrees that they had uh, attained back in Pakistan. So going back to the major hurdles that I highlighted, gender and um, origin of their country of origin of their um, foreign degree that they earned and migration policies. And I want to start with the, with the migration policies in that, in that sense. So when you, okay, before I go into this, can someone tell me what's the major form of uh, migration for females to, to the US from Pakistan is? What is the major form that, that highlights all formats? Yes. Spouse visa or family reunification. Even today, it's the number <coughs> one form of migration for fe females from Pakistan to go to the US. And what does this mean? This means that their migration status is very much dependent on the partner's legal and financial status in the US, which means that they can't get financial status until and unless their visa changes. And so what does this do, does in, in terms of getting, um, getting their um, degrees evaluated in the US? Uh, wh what this means is um, that um, their degrees are not going to be evaluated or given the same sort of status until and unless their visa category changes. So you know, these visa categories are then, um, in a sense, um, realigning the same sort of hierarchies that they face back at home. So what it does is male are very much, if they are on a visa status that enables them to work, they are very much seen as the breadwinner of the family and the female is seen as the homemaker of the family. And so that goes as a major, major drawback in, in getting them into, into the job market at, in the US. Um, so um, according to the US Consensus Bureau, Pakistani females have the lowest rate of uh, workforce participation, which is around 40%, and that is the lowest among any ethnic um, ethnicity in the US. And um, again, this falls back to the credit recognition or the uh, credential recognition um, in the US. So the credential, um, if anyone has done work on this, um, the credential, um, evaluation and recognition system in the U.S. is very, very multi-complex. Um, the U.S. at this point, so far as I know, does not have a federal centralized agency that works on getting your um, um, credentials uh, evaluated. So that creates a lot of, um, you know, misconceptions. Um, that can, creates a lot of hurdles, problems. So for example, if you are in one profession and you want to guide someone doing something else, you can't do that because the, the policies change um, and that varies from state to state. Um, and it's also very financially taxing. You know, you, you pay a lot to get your um, credentials um, evaluated in, in the US. If, if money is an issue, if finances are an issue, and you both you and your spouses are in the process of doing this, most probably it's the males who get the priority to get this done, and then the females are given again the backseat again, so that you know the vicious cycle of having those hierarchies being um, reiterated within within that system. And then, lastly, I'd like to talk about the country of origin. There is a big misconception within host societies um, that views knowledge brought by these foreigners as someone lacking, that it's not compatible to what's being taught in the US um, universities, that they can't be part of the social fabric because they have not been trained in the same way. Um, and so a lot of people, or females, I should say, I keep on saying people, it's the females that I'm talking about and Pakistani females. Um, they kept on telling me in, in my interviews, and it was heartbreaking, it's like, you know, I, I tried getting a job, but pe my employer, whoever it was, did not deem me valuable enough or knowledgeable enough to, to work in this society because they thought the knowledge I was bringing was not up to the par of the US standards. And um, even despite their tertiary degrees and their training back in Pakistan, they were asked to either start at the very low level, which I, um, term as career landing, which is a term from the corporate sector, and that means starting from the entry level jobs, you know, very basic. You Even if you have attained certain training and certain level and certain professionalism in your said 
you know, area of expertise, you're again brought to the bottom. And this is very much evident in medical fields, whether you're pertaining to be a doctor or a pharmacist, um, you are asked to again take USIMILES, which are the entrance exams in the US. And then um, if you do pass that, which is a long process in itself and, and very tedious, um, you're again seen as an intern. Doesn't matter you were GP or a heart surgeon back in Pakistan. So you're brought back to, to level one. And then the other um, uh, term that I use in, in terms of uh, the skill wastage when it comes to these females is de-skilling. And they, um, this is very much evident if you're coming into the IT sector or engineering sector, or even if you have a PhD in one of the sciences. Um, um, I should highlight here that when I was doing these interviews, I spoke to females from across different age groups. And one of them, one of my interviewees was a woman who was in her, hitting her 80s, and um, she had very much gone through the same process. She had a PhD in chemistry. She, she came to the US as a spouse of a US citizen, got her green card, and then uh, applied to be a lecturer in a university, and she was told, um, they will get back to her, and they never did. Um, she was never offered the position. Um, she got an administrative position, um, which was way out of her uh, professional training. Um, but you know, because she wanted a job, you know, when you're there, you want to uh, contribute to the financial status of your family. She took up the job. Forty years later, she retired from a very high prestige position, but in an administ administrative role, and she couldn't go back to teaching, which was heartbreaking for me to hear. So yeah, so de-skilling is, is very much evident in terms of like their professional skills um, are not taken into consideration and they're given jobs that are very much overqualified for. Um, some of the, my interviews were working as cashiers when they had degree an engineering degree and they wanted to do that because they wanted to save money so that they could get money for their degree evaluation. And so it was, it was just a vicious cycle that was going on. Um, and when I asked some of my respondees that what, what made you come to the US? And you know, if, if you are going through this process and um, you are either starting from the very bottom of the ladder or you're being de-skilled, what was the motivation? And so I, would, I want to refer back to something that Min was saying in terms of the better opportunities in, in the host country. So a lot of these people came here looking for better opportunities, but the hurdles to get to better opportunities was keeping them you know, out of the labor force and it, its ears before they can even you know, get to the point that they want to. Um, I leave it there because I do want you to read my chapter mm -hmm. and buy the book, please. It's mm -hmm. available in, in the bookstore. Uh, but yeah, I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Ms. Farah. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, we've got a taste of what the volume has, and we have some time for questions. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for the panel discussion. So my question is probably goes to everyone. Um, so usually, in most of the time when I read the publications, authors, they do address the problem, but they also hint towards the solution to encourage the readers to take a step to solve the problem. So in your work, have you tried researching about any programs or initiatives that tackle the issue of migrants? Or was your focus mainly evolved around collecting the statistical evidence to you know, prove that there is a discrimination and equality happening towards migrant workers? Thank you. Should we take a couple, maybe one or two, yeah. and then it might be better. The next, the gentleman now. Yeah, so my question just uh, refers to the point earlier. So it was said earlier about that uh, we should look at the uh, social and cultural context, uh, especially towards migration. So I'm actually just curious, um, like how does the book take into account? Like does uh, the book kind of consider like a comparative analysis in the sense, because I, when I was looking at the uh, table of contents, uh, I was seeing like East Asia and Latin America. So does the book also consider like uh, the sort of regional differences or like social and cultural differences between those and compare them. I've also heard earlier about the remittances and like comparing it to Japan in that case, but like how about like uh, from connecting it from chapter to chapter, would, does the book consider that as well? Yeah. We'll take one more, I think, Professor Hermes. 
Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, one wonderful introduction to to the book. Uh, and it's uh, um, really really exciting the topics and what you've all spoken about. I have uh, uh, two um, questions. Uh, first, uh, the, um, uh, Dr. Min, you were saying that um, the U.S. receives a lion's share of migration, which, uh, you know, with all the discourse uh, that goes around you, there wasn't something that I expect, although on reflection it makes sense. But I was w uh, wanting to know, to hear more about what kind, what the, what you mean by that, because on the other hand, it seems like they don't take the lion's share of refugees, uh, at least if that's the common perception, right? So is it like, uh, you know, someone on student visa, a migrant or, or not? Um, and then uh, for, for on the topic of uh, sort of de devaluation of uh, degrees, I it's really fascinating, this discussion that you, uh, that you gave us. I was uh, curious, because, um, you know, you're asking the woman, Right about devaluation, de and it was uh, I, I was just thinking about sort of whether there was. Um, it seems to me that there isn't any sort of formal way, right, to to think about to, or measure devaluation. So it's so it seemed to me that um, on the employer side they could mask this or hide this as like equal opportunity, right? Uh, but it's really. Um, you know, so this kind of discrimination happens uh, because there's no way to formally prove that there is a devaluation. So I was just curious if, you know, um, if that came up as a, uh, as a debate or discussion point. Okay. Should we start with men to respond and then? I... Yeah, I would like to address these questions. I think from the last one and upward. Um, so the United States takes the lion's share of international migrants. Um, so have, having said that, it's based on the, the United Nations statistics, right? So if it counts for so many international migrants, and then the, the number of migrants to the US, it's more than 25%. So it's the, talking about the lion's share, the immigrants mostly to the U.S. They are uh, they are counted as those who are holding immigrant visa, and not counting for those who are holding non-immigrant visa. However, when we are talking about the H-1B, which is the highly skilled uh, immigrant visas, and they have a pathway to uh, adjustment to immigration visa, so so for that. Um, and in terms of refugees, the absolute number, the U.S. also absorbed a larger number in terms of absolute number. But in terms of proportion, it may, it may not. So, so it's a matter of how to count, how to count it. And with your question, it, uh, they are all good questions, thank you. Uh, the comparison, like, our collection wasn't meant to be a comparative work, but we tried to pull studies that touch on different immigrant groups or major immigrant groups to the United States. So we include uh, immigrant groups from China, uh, Korea, and Japan, and immigrant groups from uh, uh, Mexico and Central America. And as a matter of fact, our chapter on um, Latin American immigration is more uh, focusing on the skilled migration rather than the undocumented migration and also the unskilled, low-skilled migration from Latin America, which is the big, you know, the bigger proportion. Um, and and so so we don't like our design is more on different case studies rather than comparative studies. But within each chapter, we bear in mind some of the comparison there. Uh, for example, my chapter, you know, comparing three different uh, East Asian group that has some comparative angle. And then chapter two on Latin American migration also have some comparative angle uh, uh, comparing Mexican migration to other Latin American migration to the U.S. Um, so with the first question, it's more on the policy impact of immigration, right? So, 
So, like, social scientists want to address social problems in the hope of resolving the problems. But how much our research got taken by policymakers, it, it's really challenging. Um, so, because policymakers are selectively, you know, take our recommendations and results. So our aim is really to understand the dynamics and the process uh, in order to, you know, provide policy implications and, you know, hopefully recommendations that policymakers would take. But that is still kind of a challenging task for us to translate our research findings into you know, policy that has impact on resolving the problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, regarding Sammy's question, uh, categorizing different population groups in different terms along like migration policies in different countries is really a matter of like politics. A lot of mm -hmm. politics is involved there. And that's why it is really difficult. So what we do usually in migration studies, we go by the most of uh, like recognized official statistics generated by International Organization of Migration, which is a body within United Nations system. So, uh, United Nations, right, yeah, okay. I always confuse between United Nations and United States, which is really bad. Um, so, uh, that is a political question, but yeah, I mean, um, if we cannot guarantee that US is the, you know, but uh, receiving country, but based on the official statistics, it is. Uh, about uh, your comparative, uh, question on comparative comparison, uh, this project, we didn't actually explicitly do comparison across cases. However, we wanted to uh, primarily understand or have a relatively comprehensive understanding of factors beyond economics. Mm -hmm. Because when people think about like going to US, most often they come up with the idea that, well, I mean, there are better economic opportunities. That's why we need to migrate. So the idea of American dream it is dream, not reality, though. So we wanted to understand what reality actually is, right? What kind of reality these people, most of these, I mean, our uh, focus was on upper end, like highly skilled and educated migrants. So for them, it should have been easy, right? They would just go there, finish education, find professional jobs, and be happy, right? But it doesn't really happen. So what actually happens in their life? That's what we wanted to explore, and that's why each chapter looks at different aspects which com in combined, like which in, in total gives us a better picture, a fuller picture about what these people might be experiencing. And if someone wants to migrate, what uh, he or she should expect, you know? It's not all rosy, but it's also not all difficult. There are ups and downs, there are opportunities, but also obstacles. And in our study, we find like more obstacles than we often think of. And um, so, and of course, uh, migration studies, uh, uh, other than purely economic research, like sociological research, anthropological or geographical research are rarely picked up by uh, policy makers, because policy does not only depend on actual data and understanding of reality, but it involves a lot of politics, which means different kinds of pressure groups with different conflicting, often conflicting, sometimes co, um, you know, co uh, and, you know, similar uh, motivations to work together or work against one another. So that's a different game. Yeah. So that's why we often do not see our work directly contributing to policy making and solving a. Pr uh, uh, problem immediately, but we we are good at like re recognizing the problems, and then different groups take on, and you know, through different kinds of activism, translate some of those into policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let me add to to that just you know a, a bit. Um, in terms of the impact of our research, we aim at understanding, right, and hopefully we can get our results across to policymakers. And unfortunately, 
the economists are doing much better than sociologists and other social scientists because economists has the quote unquote hard data and hard economic modeling. And to us, some of the economic models are based on forced assumptions. Uh, whereas sociologists and other social scientists, they are doing, you know, uh, like ethnographic research and looking at the lived experiences and nuances of these processes, right? And sometimes the results may appear to be soft, right? Not hot science and soft science. So, um, so that requires us to be more assertive. So it's a constant struggle, a, a constant fight to get our research out to the public and to the, the policy makers. And then also with regard to, uh, you know, immigrants come for economic betterment or social economic betterment, a better life. It seems that there is an economic logic behind, but actually look at the female immigrants. The main uh, thing is social, right? It's family, family unification and whatnot. So we can't just look at economic factors, but there are other factors intersecting these economic logic. Hello. So adding on um, to the policy recommendation and policy change, um, I absolutely agree with what Min and Hassan said, but I also want to add that it also matters like what administration is at the helm. So um, I do know that under Obama administration, and this is pertaining to the devaluation de of degrees, there was talk and drafting of some sort of a bill to address some of um, the issues that comes to the devaluation de of degrees, but that bill was never passed. It didn't even make the parliament. And um, with the going of uh, Obama administration and the era that we should not talk about, the Trump administration, um, they did not even consider this as a problem. They tried to revise um, the migration policy in terms of the entry to the US, and so they introduced a they wanted to introduce a point-based system where um, a potential immigrant would be given a point based on um, their nationality, the kind of degree, their age, and so forth. But that ne doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna change the profiling of, of the people coming. So for example, if you come from a developed region, let's say Canada, UK, or rest of the Europe, you get better points. Where if you come from South Asia, you get less points. So. Um, that doesn't really affect um, the, the problem at hand. Um, and that never went anywhere. So I don't know what's happening under Biden, uh, but um, there could be, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any program in, in that sense. Absolutely, Sami. Um, they are uh, hiding this as um, an equal opportunity, sort of an umbrella to, to say, you know, we couldn't consider your application because you want, we are an you know, equal opportunity uh, employer. Having said that, um, uh, some of the studies show that um, people, when they apply with two CVs, one saying, I'm a Pakistani, my name is so-and-so, and I'm from UK, and I'm so, and my name is, John, they get hired. And so it's again coming to the basic point of that epi epistemological understanding that the knowledge someone bringing from the developed world is better and refined versus someone who's coming from a developing region um, and bringing their sort of knowledge. So yes, absolutely. Great, thank you so much. We've run a little over time, but I think it was well worth it. And I'm sure you, you'll agree with me that this was a very important and interesting discussion for all of us. It's given you a teaser and taster of the book. And do uh, pick up a copy. You'll learn a lot more from it. Thank you.